I get lots of questions about what RetroArch is and how to use it. And it's a lot simpler than most people realize. It's like, imagine that you want to play some retro games, so you download an emulator. Now, imagine instead of one emulator, you download every emulator. And they all live inside one giant cosmic blender. And there's like 800 buttons on the blender. And the, the, and the blender also makes toast. And the toast is also a menu. And the menu opens a portal to the shaders dimension where time has no meaning. And the back button opens a menu called quick menu, which contains seven more menus, none of which take you back. See, I told you it was simple. Hey there, how's it going? I'm tech to be welcome. Thanks for clicking on the video today. Contrary to what was implied in the intro to, to this video, RetroArch isn't nearly as confusing as it seems at first. Re RetroArch is a huge beast with a ton of stuff you could do. It's super configurable and super powerful, but most people don't need to know about 90% of the things it can do. A deep dive RetroArch guide would be over an hour long video. Uh, heck, I could probably make an entire course on all the things RetroArch could do for you. Hey, maybe someday I'll take up Brilliant.org on that sponsorship deal and do something like that. But today we're, we're going to cover the high level concepts and just enough of the small parts that you need to know about to do most of the common RetroArch stuff. And I'm going to explain it all in a way that even you can understand. Back in the day, every emulator was its own weird little kingdom. Every emulator had its own look, its own settings, and its own way of doing things, and none of them agreed on what the word full screen meant, and if you wanted to play games from multiple systems and jump back and forth between them, well, good luck, cowboy. RetroArch solves all that. RetroArch uses something called Libretro, which is a fancy framework that lets emulator developers separate the guts of an emulator, the part that actually does the emulating. It separates that from the UI stuff like menus and settings and controller configs. So instead of every emulator building its own janky interface from scratch, the emulator developers just build a core, a little engine that runs games and plug it into RetroArch, which it handles everything else. Display settings and audio and input and shaders and save states, achievements, all that nerdy garnish. RetroArch is the program that unifies everything and it lets you, the, the user, access everything that you can do in just one interface. You can think of it like the cockpit of a retro gaming spaceship. It, it doesn't do the emulating, the cores do that, but it gives you one slick control panel to launch every system, configure things once, and actually understand what's going on. Well, sort of. Instead of learning a dozen emulators, you just learn RetroArch. Instead of a dozen video settings menus, you, you get one. I mean, granted, it has 5,000 options, but it's a lot easier than dealing with different menus across different emulators. Instead of separate save folders, controller setups, and UI styles, you get one unified system that works the same way across every core. So RetroArch might look complicated at first, but it's actually solving a problem that used to be way worse. Most handhelds use RetroArch for their emulation. Sometimes you can uh, see it, but even if you don't actually see RetroArch stuff when you're playing your games and using save states or whatever, there's a good chance that it's still RetroArch running in the background to handle the inputs and the screen drivers, and it's RetroArch that's running the emulation core to make your game work. If you have an Android doodad, you're probably familiar with RetroArch because you need to download it yourself there and set it up yourself. You can get RetroArch from their website or the Google Play Store. You might not interact with the actual RetroArch menu often after you get it all set up, but you'll have to be willing and able at least to install it and set it up if you're on an Android device. I made a guide about how to do all that, by the way, if you need a hand setting up a Android thing. And you can run RetroArch on PC. You can download RetroArch right from their website or even through Steam. You, you can just download it there if you want. Depending on which system you're using RetroArch on, it may come with different defaults and it might look different on different handhelds or whatever. There's different menu styles and color schemes, but it's all RetroArch. It has the same menu options and the same settings you can tweak, except when it doesn't. Actually, let's talk about that. One of the things that gets lots of people confused about RetroArch is that um, how you interact with it can vary wildly depending on the system that you're using. Different handheld operating systems and custom firmwares like Botocera or Newly can change or limit or completely hide certain RetroArch features. It's like going to use your microwave and then realizing that the button that sets it to the popcorn mode is actually controlled by your dishwasher. 
See, in, in many emulation station-based systems, the developers have tried to make things easier for you by letting you change settings in the operating system itself instead of having to do it in RetroArch. For example, RetroArch has hundreds of shaders, so Botocera simplifies the shaders by offering a curated list of the common ones. When you launch a game, Botocera pre-configures RetroArch with those settings that you set in the, in the system. But here's where it gets messy. Let's say that you watch a guide that recommends a specific shader. So you load up your game and then you open up the RetroArch menu and you load the shader and you save a core override like the guide says. And then the next time you load your game, it's, it's not there. Your settings are gone. That's because the operating system is overriding RetroArch's settings. Other systems though, like if you set up RetroArch yourself on an Android doodad using ESDE as the front end, they don't do that. You can do everything in RetroArch yourself yourself. You have to, actually. Most OSs fall uh, kind of somewhere in between. They might lock down some settings, but leave others open. And uh, while that can be super helpful because it stops you from accidentally breaking things, it can also be confusing when you're trying to tweak stuff and your tweaks don't seem to stick. And there's no universal rule to this, but there, there's one bit of short advice that I have. Always try to make your changes in the front end or operating system first. And if that doesn't get you what you want, then open your RetroArch menu and make your tweaks uh, while you're there in the game and save your settings. And if the changes stick, then you're good. But if they vanish next time, then your front end is overriding them and you'll need to poke around in the settings on your front end instead. So with all that out of the way, let's actually dig through all the RetroArch stuff you could do. If you already have RetroArch installed and configured, you could pr probably skip this part, but it never hurts to cover the basics. For example, subscribing to TechTweet. It's as easy as clicking that little subscribe button right there. I mean, it's basic stuff, but some people just can't figure it out for whatever reason. To demonstrate RetroArch stuff, I'm going to download a fresh copy of RetroArch from their website. I'll include the link for the download in the thingy below as well. And you can also get this from Steam, like I said. Once it's installed, you can open that up, and this is RetroArch. If you're using a controller, it should automatically be detected and work out of the box. If you're using a keyboard, you can use the arrow keys on the keyboard to navigate the menus and the Z and X button on the keyboard act like A and B on a controller. RetroArch has all the stuff you can do divided up into different menus. And there, there's three primary areas that you'll be doing stuff, which is the main menu and then the settings menu and then the quick menu. The main menu is where you'll access the, the top level functions like loading a game and downloading stuff like emulation cores and saving your global settings and uh, exiting the program. If you go to load a game, you can choose the game you want. I have this Game Boy game here, but when I go to launch it, I get a message that there's no cores available. I can download a core right from here. However, let's go back out to the main menu instead and go to this online updater section. And in here, there's a core downloader and choosing that you'll be presented with with a, a ton of cores. You can go through here and pick the cores you want to use. Here is the list of cores that I personally use most of the time, although there's others I use from time to time for various reasons. Right now for this Game Boy game, I'm just going to download good old Gambate. Now back in the main menu, I can go to load content and navigate to my game and it, it works. If you have a controller connected, it should work right away, or you can use your keyboard to play. You can use the default keyboard hotkeys if you're on a PC, but you'll need to say your own hotkeys if you want to use a controller, or if you're on an Android handheld. There's also this playlists option if you want to add an entire folder of games to a list and use RetroArch as your game launching front end. And finally in the main menu is the exit option which closes the program. Also when you have a game running you'll see the quick menu here which is for in-game settings and we'll touch on that in a bit. And then there's the settings menu which is where you could tweak stuff. RetroArch is incredibly customizable, but the defaults are generally pr pretty great, so you can just tweak the specific things that you want to change and leave the rest as it is. User interface is where you can change stuff about the, the interface. There's all sorts of things you can change in here. Everything from the size of the notifications to even the RetroArch menu itself. At the bottom here, this option called menu, that's actually different versions of the RetroArch menu. If you select one and then exit the program, when you come back, you'll see that RetroArch looks entirely different. Video settings is where you can change uh, the video stuff. 
You, you can set the program to launch in full screen mode if that's your preference. In here, you can also set some scaling options for your games. Leaving this on core provided is a good idea to start with, and you can change this on a per system basis if you have specific systems that you want to see in a certain way. I mean, really, you can just leave all this stuff by, uh, as the defaults. Same thing with the audio settings. You, you can leave this as default. Only go in here and tweak stuff if you need to for some reason. Input is um, important because this changes a lot of things about your gaming experience. And then you can also go into hotkeys and set those. These aren't set by default. However, the keyboard hotkeys are, but if you want to use them on your controller, you'll need to set them. If you're on a controller that has a specific hotkey button, you can use that as your hotkey enable button. But nine times out of 10, I just set the hotkey enable to the select button. Here's the list of hotkeys that I set. This is my personal preference. And even though it's the best preference, you might have a different, worse way that you prefer. So just set them to whatever you want. One more thing that I always do is go into menu controls and, and set, to, set it to swap the OK and cancel buttons. And one final thing that I like to do is disable confirm quit. I don't like to double tap quit to exit the game. There's other stuff that we could get into like latency settings and driver stuff. I mean, I'm not going to go deep on anything else in here in this video because this is supposed to be a simple guide. But if you want to go poking around and explore, no one can stop you. Certainly not me. I can't make anyone do anything. I'm just a funny retro guy who lives in your phone. When you're done tweaking settings, yeah, if you go to the main menu and configuration file, you can choose to save the current configuration, which will save all of the settings that you've set as the new global default settings. RetroArch is automatically set up to save the configuration file for you every time you exit the program, but I always manually save it anyways, just to be doubly sure. I think I have trust issues. There is one more menu that we need to talk about, which is the quick menu. That's like in-game settings. But before that, we need to go over a topic that is a bit confusing, but it should make a lot of concepts more clear once you understand this. Up until now, we've been tweaking the global settings in RetroArch, which are saved in the RetroArch configuration file. However, you can also have game or core specific configurations, which are called overrides, if you want specific settings for specific games or cores. But overrides can contain a, a, any settings that you want. If you're, if you're playing a Game Boy game and you open the RetroArch menu and you change a bunch of stuff in the RetroArch settings and then you save the core override, those things will be applied when you load up Game Boy games. It only records the changes that you make that are different from the RetroArch default configurations that you set. This gets a lot of people stuck up and it, it, it's a bit confusing until you wrap your head around it. So my advice is to set your global settings first without a game loaded, save your configuration from the main menu, and then when you tweak settings while a game is loaded and if you want to, to keep those settings for that game or core, you can save the game override or the core override. And if you want to go and tweak the global settings again, you can close any game that you have running and then make your changes and then save the current config, which will be global. You can also remove an override. So let's say that you messed up your settings and you saved it as a core override. And now every time you load a Game Boy game, it's all messed up. You can use the overrides menu to remove the core override and then, then it'll be gone. And then the next time you load up that core, you'll be back to the, the default. And if you screw it up again, you just take it off in the same way. The quick menu is where we get our in-game options. There are a few important areas here. The core options uh, is all the stuff that has to do with that specific system core. So, so for instance, in the Gambate core settings, we, we can change all the Game Boy stuff like the colorization or whatever. By default, whatever settings you change in here will be saved when you exit the game, but you can also manually save them under the manage core options option. The controls is where you can change the control bindings. This is different than setting up your controller itself. In here is where you can specify which button on the controller you've already set up does what function in the emulator. For instance, I prefer A and B on my controller to be rotated a bit so that X is my B button and the B is my A button. So I do that in the controller settings. This setting, you do need to manually save it uh, in this input menu and you can do it on a per game basis. Uh, for example, like if you like a specific control scheme for a specific game or on a core basis so that all the games in this system use this controller setup. This overlays section is where you can choose uh, an overlay for your system, you know, like the bezel around the screen. 
PyTorch comes with a few overlays, but not many. You can download more yourself. You can adjust the latency settings with the latency menu, apply cheats with the cheat menu. I'm not going to go into those, but they're there if you want to tinker. This last section is the shader section. There's lots of stuff you can do with shaders. I made a video about shaders. Check that out if you want a complete shaders guide. The short version is that you just turn on the shaders and then go to load preset. And depending on which system you're on, you'll use either GLSL or slang shaders. It has to do with vi which video driver you're using. On PC, it defaults to slang. Open that and then pick which preset you like. I'm going to choose the handheld Game Boy shader since I'm playing a Game Boy game. And then you need to go back to the main shaders menu and go to save preset and then save the core preset. However, that just means that this shader is going to be selected whenever shaders are enabled. You still need to save the core override to make sure that the toggles for the shaders option is saved. This is just a weird shader specific thing with RetroArch. So just remember that for shaders, you need to save it in the shaders menu and save it in the core override. And just go watch my shaders guide because I explain all this in detail there. And that's it. That's all I really wanted to show you today. I, I know, I know, it's, it's confusing. But I've covered the basics here, and if you can wrap your noodle around this stuff, you're like 90% of the way to becoming a pro. The best way to learn, a bit besides watching this video on loop until your eyeballs melt, is to just install RetroArch on your PC. Use that as your retro practice dojo. Try stuff, download a core, add a game, tweak the controls, apply a shader, save the settings, and if it all goes bad, just delete it and install it again. No harm done. It's a low stress way to try stuff without worrying that you're going to mess up your retro handheld and have a headache getting it back to the way it was. RetroArch is weird and confusing, but once it clicks, it really clicks. It, it gives you the power to fine tune your gaming experience in ways that you would never be able to otherwise. But that's, that's it. That's it from me for today. Click the thumbs up button if you liked the video or don't if you didn't. I'm TechDweeb. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.